I want you to think about this morning this idea of a crown and who wears it. In every part of life, somebody wears the crown. What I mean by that is somebody is king, somebody is in control, somebody has the power. For example, in your household, the person who controls the thermostat typically is king. That's the person who has power. Uh, if you grew up in a household full of boys like me, maybe the person who's in power was the one who got to control the video game controller. That person, they were the one who ruled for the moment. Uh, in work, you have somebody who is king. Somebody who at the end of the day you turn to and they have the final word, the final say, they are in control. Every part of life, in some way or another, there is somebody who rules. And uh, This morning, what I want us to simply consider in our own life, take a personal a reflection and say, who is it that rules my life? Who is it that is in control? Who would we say is king? I think it's hard for us sometimes as Americans to think about who is our king because it's a foreign concept to us. Uh, for us, the only kings we really know are Berger, um, LeBron James, Elvis. Like We don't really get this idea of a king. Uh, we're free people, and that's a blessing. But it's hard for us to understand being under the throne or under the rule of someone. But yet the truth is for every single person here this morning, somebody is ruling our life. Somebody does wear the crown. And typically speaking, if it's not God, our king usually is ourself. It's weird to think about. If I said, hey, if you were king for a day, what would you do? What would you do? Isn't that hard to even imagine? Because for the most part, outside of a few things that we maybe don't like to do, like paying taxes or something like that, we already do what we want to do, don't we? We already rule our life. But yet if we come here this morning and Jesus is king and he is supposed to be our king, maybe it's a good time to take a step back and say, does Jesus really rule my life this morning? And so I would invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 1 with me because I want us to look at this question. Just a short introspection of who wears the crown in our life. Who is it that sits on the throne? Who is it that rules? I think for many people, the person that is their king or their ruler is themselves. That's the one whose say goes. That's the one whose feelings or thoughts or intentions matter most. That is the person who wears the crown, who sits in that king's seat Jesus came to earth as Messiah, as king. That word Lord, he is king. And he has earned the right to be king. He's qualified for it in every way. King of creation. He has made everything we know of in this universe. He came to earth, as mentioned earlier, as a man. He lived a perfect life. He performed signs and wonders, power that's not normal to the typical man. He died and was resurrected from the grave. He is king. But there's a difference between saying Jesus is king and Jesus is my king. And this morning what I want us to think about is Jesus the king of my life or our life together. When we read scripture, what we see from, the, from about as early as we possibly can is that if we are our own king, it's a very bad choice. If we choose to rule our own life, it's not a very good choice. It doesn't work out the way we think it will. There might be some temporary benefit, so to speak, but in the long run, it, it's not a good decision to rule yourself. For example, look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. In the creation account, on day 6, after God has made uh, thing after thing, part of this universe as we know it, we get to day 6 where He makes man in His image, and I want you to notice a few of the verses and the, the commands that God gave to man. It said in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And I want you to notice in those verses, just a few of those words that are underlined. 
He tells man, he tells Adam and Eve, I want you to have dominion over created things. I want you to subdue it, being the earth. I want you to have dominion. God is, in a way, saying these words, what they mean is, I want you to rule. Over all this creation I have made, I want you to rule over it. Now, he's not saying, I have made you on an equal playing field with me as God, or I have made you, he's made us in his image, but not like God himself. We are not gods or anything you hear like that. But he says, I want you to be a ruler over all creation. And what we learn very quickly in the Genesis account, in the creation account, is we make very bad rulers. Because while they were told to rule, it doesn't take long until they decide, I need to rule a little more. I need to be king over a little more. I need to control every part of my life. And if you look at Genesis 3, and I know there's more to this, but we see the result of what happens when mankind decides that they're going to be their own king in a way. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it, of its fruit, and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. There was only one guideline. Can you imagine that? You live in perfection. To enjoy, to subdue, to rule over. You get to live amongst God. And there's only one thing you're told not to do. And we think, how could you mess that up? We'd mess that up too, don't we? He says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't do that. For if you do it, you shall surely die. And at some point, along some time frame, they decide to do it. Now, they were deceived by the tempter, by the serpent, by Satan. We know that. And in this deception, uh, it changed everything. They were deceived into thinking they knew better than God. They were deceived into thinking that what they saw or what they felt or what they thought was right or, God, or, right or good really was right or good. They were deceived uh, into thinking they could be like God. They were deceived into making themselves their own God or their own king. They decided, I'm going to rule what I think or what I feel is best. And I'm going to live by that. And the consequences were great. That word is underwhelming to describe the consequences of sin. Because we see that man is cursed, women and men. We see the earth that they live upon is now cursed forever. We still live in a fallen, broken world with an, on an earth that is cursed. We see they are removed from the garden. There is a, a loss of fellowship from God in a way. No longer will they get to walk amongst God in this perfection, but they are closed off from the garden forever. And maybe more than anything, death enters the world. Sin enters the world, and it's plagued mankind ever since. And all of that goes back to, or starts with, God's people... Or God's creation deciding they should rule themselves in a way. Listen, when we rule our own lives, we learn we aren't good at being king. We don't make a good ruler. We're not a good person to control our own life. We're not a good person. We're not the person who should be sitting in the throne seat when it comes to our life. We're not good at it. It didn't take very long for mankind to learn this. But yet, even today, we're still struggling with this, aren't we? When you try to live life based off your own thoughts or feelings or your own desires, do you ever get caught up realizing that was a bad decision? Do you ever suffer consequences of that too? I think we all have learned this and are learning it. And there are many people today who sadly do not know there is someone else who is better fit to sit in the seat of king. There are many people who the person who guides them in their life is themselves. And that has great consequences. And for us just to start, understand... We're not meant to be king of our life. There is someone else far more qualified who truly knows what's right and what's good, who should be sitting in that seat, who should be wearing the crown. We aren't good at being king. And this theme or this idea of us trying to rule our life, it continues, and it's throughout Scripture. For example, look at uh, uh, Exodus, Exodus chapter 19. You know, from the beginning of God's story, we learn we're not good kings. We make a mess of this life. We let the wrong things lead us, and it leads to great consequences. It leads us straight to sin. And even though we want to be free and we want to be in control of our own lives, we realize that we shouldn't because we make a mess of it. And, 
But yet we still have this desire at times to rule ourselves. If you look at Exodus chapter 19, notice what God says to Moses on the mountain as he starts to make this covenant with his people. He says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. He's freed them. He's liberated them from captivity, from slavery in Egypt. He's brought them out in a miraculous way. They've seen sign and wonder and after wonder of how God is working to free them. Surely he should be king. Surely that God is powerful. That God is the God. And he, Moses gets on this mountain to make this covenant. And he says, if you will follow me, if you will hear my words, if you will obey my voice, I'll make you a kingdom of priests. I'll make you a kingdom people. You think about today in New Testament times. We're a kingdom. God has built and is building a kingdom. And he says, I'm going to make you a kingdom. And it, Moses can't even get off the mountain before mankind, mankind decides they, they want to rule themselves again. Look at Exodus 32 and verse 1. He can't even get down from the mountain until these people who've witnessed God's greatness already decide maybe they should go another route. It says in Exodus 32 and verse 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I don't know exactly how long it was off the top of my head. I can't remember. But it's almost like, hey... You know, it was cool the way that God led us out of Egypt, and Moses seemed to have a relationship with that God, but it's been a while, and I'm a little impatient, and, and while, we don't know where he went or if he's coming back. So, Aaron, how about you make us gods? How about you make for us images? And we see the golden calf picture later on in the book of Exodus, but they can't even wait for him to get down from the mountain until they decide they know better again, until they decide, how about we rule our own life? And in this way, they make a God to worship. Doesn't that seem weird to us? Like, why make an image and bow down to that? You think melting some gold and making a golden calf, you think that's worthy of your worship? And we struggle to understand idolatry, I think. But listen, we are far more experienced at idolatry than we realize. Sometimes the God who rules our life is the one we've made. You know, for them, they are ruling their life anyway at this moment. They want to make a God to bow down to, and we think that's foreign, but don't we at sometimes make a God in our own image and it controls us? You know, for us, a lot of times the God we worship or we can worship is the person we look at in the mirror. For many people, the God that they worship is the person staring right back at them. For some, sometimes the God that we worship is a mixture of things that we mold for example, we take a little God of the Bible and we take a little bit of our own feelings and we smack them together and we make an image for ourselves, and that's the God that rules or worships. It's interesting, if your God thinks and feels all the ways you naturally think and feel, I don't think the God of the Bible is your God. That means you are your own God. You rule yourself. And for us, the self really is the God of our culture. It might not be a golden calf or some image. It might not have a sacrifice on an altar, but we sacrifice to it all the same. It's the one who gets the attention. It's the one who gets the devotion. It's the one we sacrifice for. It's the one that gets our glory and our praise and our thankfulness. Sometimes we are just like them where we try to rule ourself or the God that we say rules us really is just an image of ourself. It's the one we've made. And when we rule our own life, we forget and ignore who's really in control. We forget and ignore who really has the power, who really deserves the position, who truly knows what's good and what's best. And we, get, we follow down a terrible path when we rule ourselves. I'll show you one more example of this idea of trying to be your own king. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 8. You know, God's people should always have God as their king. That sounds obvious, but the children of Israel struggled with this over and over again. In the book of Judges, they would be with God, but then they would do evil in the sight of the Lord. You see that phrase time and time again, almost every chapter. It said they would abandon God for idols. They would choose another king, and eventually they'd get so caught up in sin and so taken over, they would have to cry out to God and repent. 
And for us, if, if we are serving a God who is not God, we need to cry out and repent too. If we've abandoned God for something else. But over and over again this happened. Until you get to 1 Samuel 8. And if you start reading there in verse 4, it says, All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. But they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Israel wanted to be like everyone else. Hey, they have kings. That nation has a king and they have a king. And How about we get a king too? Ignoring the idea that they've had a king all along in God. That God has always been their king. But no, I want someone else. I want something earthly to bow down to. I want someone else to rule over me. And God being rejected allowed it. If that's your choice, you can make that choice. If I want to rule myself, if I want to follow myself, if I want to make my own God, he'll let me do it. But it won't go the way I think. If you want a king in your life, or if I want a king in my life other than Jesus, God will let me make it. God will let me make that choice. But it won't work out the way we think it will. For example, he warned them in verse 18. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. He warned them. This choosing a king is not going to go the way you think it will. God was a far better option, yet they chose what they wanted. And for us, we have the same choice. We're free to make a God of our choosing. We're free to let anybody wear the crown in our life, especially us, which typically is the choice. But in the long run, it won't work out the way we think it will. It won't be a blessing, and we'll be crying out as well. He says, you will cry out in that day. The only person who should be ruling our life is Jesus. He is the one and true king. And I think every single person, if if not all, but about everybody in here this morning would agree that Jesus is king. That he is God of creation, that he came to earth, he lived and died, he's resurrected. You know, Acts chapter 2, let it be known that this man whom you've crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. I think all of us would agree that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, that he is the ruler, coming back one day. But it's very different to say Jesus is king than to say Jesus is my king. And so this morning, all I want to ask is who is my king? Just a time to have some introspection, you and myself included. Who is my king? Who is steering the ship? You remember driver's ed? You remember practicing driver's ed? Some of you are like, yeah, it was my father and my mother, and I had a panic attack every time I got in the car. Your parent felt the same way, I would imagine. But you ever drive by someone, and it says, I'm a student driver, and they have two wheels? I slow down quite a bit. <laughs> I get away from them. It's hard to imagine two people controlling the wheel. We don't do it any other time for a very good reason. Because we know there can only be one captain. There can only be one king. There can only be one person in charge of the wheel. Who is that in our life? Who's steering the ship? Who is the one that gets the say in our decisions? You know, when we're tempted and those urges and those feelings and those desires come, who is the person we listen to first? I know we're going to sin, we're not perfect, but who is the person time and time again that, oh, my feelings come, that's what I want, I do that. Maybe we're our own king. Or is it God to where we reject what we might want because he is our ruler? Who is the person whose word goes on issues of the world and of our lives? Who is the person we say, their word is final? That's the person we turn to and say, they, they get the final decision. Whose thoughts and feelings guide me? Maybe a good question is, who do my actions say is king? You know, if you looked at my life and the way I live, would you trace that back to Jesus being my king or would you trace it back to me ruling over myself? Who is our king this morning? It's, it's just something for all of us to think about and I think about it in my own life. And maybe the thing that all of us need to do in our life is let go of the crown. 
Listen, if Jesus isn't your king, if he is not my king this morning, it's time to let go of the crown. It's time to give it up. It's time to give it to him. We do not deserve to wear it. We're not qualified. We were never meant to wear it. He deserves to be king. He's done everything to earn it. So let him be king. It's hard at first. It's a, it's a struggle. It's a give and take. But let him have control. That looks a few different ways in life. It might be this morning that you have never given Jesus that seat in your life. You've never made him king. Well, that starts with confessing him as Lord. We read that verse this morning about confessing him before men. Well, we need to confess him as Lord, period. Let him be king. It might be time to repent. To say, I've been living for me. He deserves the crown. Give him control of your life. Repent. Follow him. Put him on this morning. Let him become king of your life. Become one of his kingdom people in the waters of baptism by faith. But for the many of us in here who have done those things, it's a good time to reflect and say, I, I said Jesus was my king. I made him my king. But is he still my king? Is he still wearing the crown? Am I living like he's in charge or have I taken back control? And if you've taken back control, if I've taken back control this morning, it's a great time to, to let go of that crown once again. There is no one better to let lead your life than Jesus. Don't rule your own life. From the very beginning, God tells us it's not a good, it doesn't work out for you. So let God have control this morning. If you have a need to let Jesus become the Lord of your life, to put him on, to become a Christian, or if you have a need to let go of the crown and respond in a public way this morning, you can come now while we stand and while we sing.